Okay, this is part 10 of the recording of the reading and commentaries by myself, Dr. Abraham Weisfeld of the Political Science Departments at the University of Quebec Montreal, commenting on and reading of the study and book published by Cambridge University Press with Lars Fisher entitled Socialist Response to Antisemitism in the German Imperial State. That is during the time of the Second International. So he's doing critique of the Second International revisionist uh, position on what was called at one point the Jewish question. And this critique, of course, applies to all subsequent Marxist views which adopted this, the revisionist position on national identity, basically, until the work by Stalin, which treated the subject with some clarity, but, of course, refused to recognize the Jewish nationality as it exists. And that was built upon the sectarian rejection of the Jewish pun by Lenin in particular. Even though he was one quarter Jewish, I understand. A grandfather way back. Okay, so let's share and read. We're on page 84 right now. And here we go. Within this scheme of things, the way in which the Jews or by those Semites and anti-Semites see the world and respond to it, to return to our main argument, is formed both by the objective circumstances and by subjective choices. The issue is not whether their perceptions and stances are a matter of circumstance or of choice, but how circumstance and choice mix to make Jews and anti-Semites think and act as they do. Against this backdrop, it is surely remarkable that social democratic commentators are inclined to draw such uneven conclusions. Anti-Semitism, they understood, predominantly is determined by the circumstances. Philo-Semitism, they understood predominantly as a matter of choice. Both were supposedly doomed. Yet, while the demise of anti-Semitism could generally be left to a change of the circumstances that generated it in the first place, the philo needed to be taken to task for their wrong choices. Those in the thrall of anti-Semitism were best treated with patience, not least to avoid alienating them by treating them in an unduly harsh, harsh manner. Yet it was considered a matter of considerable urgency to show the philo the error of their ways and to do so in no uncertain terms. Yes, the poor anti-Semites who need to be coddled, poor babies. Okay, the section now reads the Jewish question, in quotes, in der Hegel's family, in Hegel's family, that is the Hegelians including the left Hegelians. In one important respect, it is much easier for us to interpret and contextualize our Judenfrage than it was for Babel and Liebknecht and their peers. We can directly trace the development of Marxist stance by comparing the Judenfrage with the three sections discussing the Jewish question in a work published but a year later under the title The Heilige Family. Oh, the Holy Family. Oh. Scholars discussing the Judenfrage have occasionally taken note of these slightly later comments in the Heilige Family. Yet they have generally remained rather vague regarding the possible implications of these remarks for the evaluation of the Judenfrage. Is Karl Lebach right in suggesting that Marx practically rewrote the Judenfrage in the Heilige Family? If by that 
Kalbach means that the notions reflected in the two texts are substantially at odds, and by implication that Marx set out to rewrite Zer Judenfrage with the intention of publicly setting the record straight, then the answer is clearly no. Why then did Marx return to this issue so soon if it was not his intention to set the record straight? The explanation is simple enough. The Holy Family, whom the Heilige Family set out to destroy, were none other than Bruno Bauer and Consorten. And Marx's renewed discussion of the Jewish question in the Heilige Family was simply an outgrowth of his ongoing critique of Bauer. It was not interest in the Jewish question itself that made Marx return to this topic. It was the opportunity this debate offered him to show Bauer up. Avinari rightly identified Marx's strategy in the three relevant sections of the Heilige family. His main point is that Bauer did not get the better of his Jewish critiques, of his Jewish critics, even though they were far inferior to Bauer as polemicists. That this is Marx's actual motivation in returning to the issue is also borne out by another fact. None of Marx's references to Bauer's Jewish critics actually draw on their original contributions to the controversy. Marx is familiar with them only from Bauer's responses to them. In other words, he never actually engaged the debate as such. His point of reference was exclusively Bauer's writings. It was because they touched on the Jewish question that Marx's critique of Bauer also engaged this issue again. Karl Lebach is none, nevertheless right in stating that Marx set out to correct the inadequacies of the earlier essays in The Holy Family. Of course, Marx saw certain things clearer when working on the Heilige family than he had done when preparing Zer Judenfrage. His sustained confrontation with Bauer was instrumental in allowing him to clarify his thought on a number of issues and the controversy concerning the Jewish question had played an important role in bringing about that confrontation to a head. Clearly, Marx wanted to be even more spot on now than he had already been a year earlier, but we really have no indication that Marx was in any way unhappy with Zara Judenfrage and now wanted to put things right. Far from it. In April 1851, Hermann Becker began to publish a collection of Marx's Gesam Gesammelte as Aufstatze. Ah, okay collected essays. That, in the event, never got beyond the first installment because Becker was arrested the following month. Marx was consulted on the publication of this collection and was perfectly happy to see Zer Judenfrage included in it. Surely he would at least have questioned this decision had the relevant sections of the Heilige family genuinely been intended to supersede what he had written in Zer Judenfrage. In short, we can confidently read the relevant sections of the Heilige family as a check and corrective for Zer Judenfrage in the sense that they allow us to determine the most likely actual meaning or thrust of statements that remained ambiguous in Zer Judenfrage. Compared with Zer Judenfrage, we indeed find a number of significant shifts in emphasis in the Heilige family. In the Heilige family, the, quote, vigorous polemic of the first essay, i.e., the Zer Judenfrage, is transferred from the Jews to Bauer. The Heilige family indeed stresses the historical necessity of social and political development by drawing a sharper, quote, contrast of the positive and negative aspects of civil society. This implicitly allows Marx to present a more progressive, no, a more positive view of the role of the Jew in civil society as an agent of change. If society is undergoing both positive and negative change, 
Jewry's implication in that change obviously must have both positive and negative aspects too. But Marx goes even further in the Heilige family. He, in fact, takes a degree to which Jews enjoy political and civil rights as a criterion for the modernity of any particular state. He makes it perfectly clear that the rights of man have, first of all, to be achieved in order to be transcended, an issue that Naumann has also stressed. With Bauer, quote, Jewry disappears without having participated in the process of emancipation. For Marx, it disappears after having participated in civil emancipation. This distinction is fundamental, unquote. I think uh, break time is coming up. Yes, I think it's coming up, it's coming up, and it's here. Okay, now we continue with the reading and commentary on Lars Fischer's study and book on the socialist response to anti-Semitism in the German imperial state, that is during the Second International, and what they got wrong, and what uh, wrongful heritage they have bequeathed to the Third and Fourth Internationals even. Okay, now the uh, I noticed that the Share screen doesn't give you a very good image of the text itself when it's carried by YouTube. So I would suggest that people, in order to follow it, the actual reading of the text could go to the link that I put into the chat and that I will put into the comments after the YouTube video is uploaded. And so we continue. Now, on page 87. It looks like we've gotten a, a third of the way through the book. Okay. This is a really serious study. This is the best I've ever seen. And it's not Zionist. It's not Marxist. Marxist. It's academic. Okay, here we go. Yet perhaps the most dramatic clarification that the Heilige family offers vis-à-vis -vis the Jürgenfrage is contained in a seemingly unremarkable formulation that claims to state nothing new. Supposedly, it merely paraphrases the Jürgenfrage. In the Jürgenfrage on the Jewish question, Marx explained he had demonstrated the following, that the task of Transcending of Gehiven. Yes, I love that word. Transcending. Of Sehub. Of Zuhaben. Of Zuhaben. Transcending. I don't know. That's not, a, that's not the literal translation. It's tra transcending is a good translation, but of Zuhaben means to lift oneself up. To lift oneself up. That is to stand up or to acquire a higher consciousness. Okay, so of Sehaben, transcending the Jewish essence, oh, the Jewish essence, Mark says, in fact, amounted to the task of transcending the Jewishness of bourgeois society. Thus, you datum der bürgerlichen Gesellschaft. Okay, that's another mistranslation. <clears throat> transcending the Jewishness of bourgeois society. It, it can be translated, uh, it can be translated as the bourgeois class or the bourgeois society, although the two don't go together. So even that doesn't work. But, you know, the, the term burger is also used to mean citizen. Ma at first, you know, like, of course, only the landed, you know, like uh, aristocracy were citizens or or <clears throat> any property owners were citizens, you know, in, in a city dwell, in a city context. But they weren't necessarily bourgeois, even at that point. So it was like a, a traditionalist kind of a 
translation to call it bourgeois society, but Bergerlichen actually means the citizens, citizens' environment, or, and in political science, this would be more correct, civil society. Okay? Now, referring again from Marx to transcending the Jewishness of of the Jewishness of civil society, which is doesn't make any sense, you know, like I the inhumanity of present day practical life epitomized by the money system, guilt system. Ah, oh, so that's what it means. That's what Jewishness is, huh? According to Marx. Well, really, really. This is all big, messy stuff, you know. Okay, we might also we might note in passing the use of the term of Sahaben. Yes, what about it? Given the Hegelian background of the whole debate, Marx obviously used this term intentionally. In this context, it denotes the following. A superior new state of affairs does not merely abolish or negate the inferior state of affairs. It succeeds. It can also generally transcend the earlier state of affairs if it preserves and consummates the valid and perfect, perfectible elements inherent in that earlier state of affairs. The implication, then, is that the Jewish essence would not simply be made to disappear without trace. Rather, its valid and perfectible core would be preserved and truly come in, on, into its own within a more advanced state of affairs. Admittedly, though, in its perfected form within that more advanced state of affairs, this core would then no longer be in any way specifically Jewish, even though Jewish essence is supposed to be preserved because it doesn't know what Jewish essence is. Okay. More important for our main line of argument, however, is this. One of the major problems we have with the interpretation of Zara Judenfrage and German texts on antisemitism and matters Jewish more generally is a linguistic one. The term Judaitum can cover what are in English three distinct concepts. Oh, now we're getting serious. Could be Judaism, Jewry, and Jewishness, or and or Jewishness. Let's say. <clears throat> Take the final clause of the much cited, indeed, infamous last sentence of the second part of Zerjudenfrage. Okay, here it is. The gesellschaftlich emancipation, the Juden, is the emancipation de Gesellschaft von Judentum. Marx claimed here the you know, it's mistranslation. You can't say Juden means the Jews as if it was a plural, singular plural. No, it's not even singular plural. It's just singular possessive. I don't know. I'm... The Jews' social emancipation is the emancipation of society from, from what exactly? In this context, Judaism could mean either Judaism or Jewry, though not in this form, Jewishness. Society emancipation from Judaism? No. Society emancipation from Jewry. Ah, oh, that's what he means. Yeah. Okay. Whether we assume Judaism to mean Judaism or Jewry in this context, oh, come on. Be brave. Take a position. Either way, the formulation can lend itself to rather unpalatable interpretations that imply a need for society to purge itself of the essentially extraneous Jewish influence. Yeah. And more than that. Now let's revisit the formula, formulation in Der Heilige Family. There, Marx stated that it was das Judenten der Bergerlichen Gesellschaft that needs to be transcended. In this form, that can mean only one thing. What needs to be transcended is the Jewishness of bourgeois society. So it was not referring to Jewish people per se, but bourgeois society, which is Jewish. Huh. 
Is that supposed to be better? <laughs> okay. Well, let's see. <clears throat> to be sure, this line of argument is problematic enough in its own right. And with the benefit of hindsight, it is all the more obvious just how troubling its implications actually are. You know, like such academic language, you know, like really sort of, you know, soft peddling it. Yeah. Okay. We know just how futile at best the supposedly anti-Judeophobic strategy of denouncing the anti-Semites as the real, albeit uncircumcised, Jews has proved. The suggestion that the Jewish influence has long ceased to be a merely extraneous one and has in fact seeped into the very heart of non-Jewish society, thus all the more insidiously corrupting its very essence, has turned out to be a particularly potent and dangerous trope integral to modern anti-Semitism <clears throat> or Judeophobia. But then Marx wrote in the Jugendfrage several decades before the emergence of modern political anti-Semitism. Oh, really? Well, I guess that means he was a contributor. He was no historian of anti-Semitism, and anti-Semitism was not the concern of Zerjudenfrage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not a concern. Yeah, on the Jewish question, but anti-Semitism is not a concern. Okay, I get it. We now look on Bauer as one of the intellectual founding fathers of modern political anti-Semitism, and not Marx. And there are indeed elements in their Judenfrage that prefigure his later fully-fledged anti-Semitism. But the Bauer of the Judenfrage still belongs very much to the prehistory of modern anti-Semitism rather than its history, and we need to read their Judenfrage in the context of that prehistory not as a response to modern anti-Semitism proper. Mm -hmm. It's problematic implications notwithstanding. Problematic. <laughs> I like that word, but in this context, <laughs> it's a joke. It's problematic implications notwithstanding. Then, Marx's statement in Die Heilige Family that society needed to transcend its own Jewishness makes the Jewish question, an issue that society has with itself rather than an issue that society has with the Jews as an alien entity. It seems inconceivable that he should have seen this one way when writing Zer Judenfrage and the other when preparing the Heilige family. Hence, this is surely also the correct interpretation of the more ambiguous formulation at the end of Zer Judenfrage. Aha, uh -huh. I thought so. Okay, if we read both parts of the Judenfrage together, it is clear that Marx's main concern was the suggestion that the formal emancipation of the Jews presupposed their assimilation. This suggestion he rejected for two reasons. Mm -hmm. Firstly, it made no sense to demand the disappearance of a distinct in brackets, supposedly religious identities, if the material conditions that generated these identities in the first place were not going to change. Okay. The Jews were as unpleasant as they admittedly were because the conditions they were forced to live in were untenable. Hmm. As long as the state was was in no position to change those conditions for the better, it was in no way superior to the Jews. Thus, secondly, the state had no grounds on which to refuse the Jews their formal emancipation. As we saw, Marx's line of argument was this. In the past, the specific, the specific socio-economic conditions that had generated the specifically Jewish identity had been exceptional and peripheral to society as a whole. Huh. Except that Jewish people existed before society existed, before Europe existed. Now, however, these socioeconomic conditions were becoming characteristic of society in its entirety. Hence, the conclusion that society as a whole was becoming Jewish. Ooh. Now, non-Jews who took on Jewish characteristics obviously did so because of the Jewishness of the society in which they lived, 
not because they were in any conventional sense of the word Jews. And they weren't guilty, of course, you know, like, like the Jews were. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. Okay, understand. Strictly speaking, the same would now obviously have to apply to individuals who really were of Jewish extraction. They maintain their Jewishness not because they happen to be of Jewish extraction, but because they lived in an increasingly Jewish society. Hmm. They did differ from non-Jews in one important respect, though. Whereas the non-Jews had to learn their Jewishness from the bottom up, as it were, the Jews had a head start on them because of their Jewish background. <laughs> so the Jewish background is this... Uh, uh, you know, money economy, you know, you know, like it gets worse and worse. So, you know, this is what the Jewish background is, you know, like this. So Jewishness is a money, is a money economy, you know, like, you know, how shallow can you get? Okay. In this sense, then, on the level of formal or political emancipation, far from being less qualified than non-Jews to exercise full citizenship rights, the Jews were in fact better prepared to do so than the non-Jews. Oh. On the level of comprehensive human emancipation, the implication was that Jews and non-Jews alike would ultimately have to struggle in equal measure to overcome what was now emerging as generalized Jewishness of society as a whole. This interpretation of Marx's line of argument, again, represents a rationalization. Yes. Marx's formulations in Der Judenfrage were as ambiguous as they were not, because he somehow, fa somehow failed to find quite the right words. Oh. <laughs> they were as ambiguous as they were because Marx took great pleasure in elaborating on the way in which full human emancipation would transcend not only the Jewishness of society as a whole, but also all the concrete and specific unpleasantness he and his contemporaries contemptuously associated with real existing Jewry. Oh, you know, okay. So he hated Jewish people. I understand. It is worth reminding ourselves, though, that it was nevertheless Jewry's unpleasantness that Marx thought this process would do away with, and by no means the Jewish individuals displaying that unpleasantness. Unpleasant, pleasantness. Unpleasantness. <laughs> Yet in the Heilige family, the urge to dwell on this unpleasantness and its negation in so juicy and detailed a fashion is no longer evident. Consequently, this urge cannot have been crucial to the main line of argument in the first place. Yeah. It's like a cover-up argument. Okay. Finally, we might note that Marx maintains his negative fixation on the guilt system, the money economy, in the Heilige family. This is noteworthy because it demonstrates that even the pre-Marxist Marx, who had not yet developed his distinct concept of capitalism, already gave up on the notion that Jewry could be singled out as being responsible for the socioeconomic changes he and his contemporaries were witnessing. In other words, even while he still lacked more systematic understanding of socioeconomic development inclined towards a demonization of the money economy, he concluded and publicly stated that the real problem, far from merely concerning a minority living in its midsts, was in fact inherent in the way society as a whole was organized. Oh, okay. So Jewishness was his name for capitalism at that point. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> oh no. Consequently, if we read not only both parts of Zer Judenfrage together, but also interpret Zer Judenfrage in con conjunction with the relevant sections of the Halacha family, we come to a very clear conclusion. However ambiguous and problematic Marx's line of argument may have been, it was inordinately more sophisticated than the attitudes prevalent in the socialist movement and the suggestion that these attitudes drew directly on Marx's own position are almost entirely untenable. Hmm. I believe it. The problem, however, is this. The Erhalicha family was not only even more difficult to get hold of than Zer Judenfrage, but its very existence and significance was far less present in the minds, of e the minds even of leading social democrats. 
while Babel automatically turned to Zerjutenfrage for a short, snappy quote to shore up his own authority, he would not have dreamt of turning to the Heilige family. And it's, in, so, in many ways, much more precise formulations on the matter. Why not? Simply because the existence and relevance of Zerjutenfrage was firmly impressed on the minds of many socialists, whereas the Heilige family was terra incognita, unknown territory. Boy, ignorant people. Yeah, it's not terra incognita. It's a, it's a cerebrum incognita, you know, ignorant minds. Yeah, that would be more appropriate. As we saw, the claim that Zeri Judenfrage was re only really became widely available again with Meiring's Nach Lash, Nach, Nach Lash As Gob is rather questionable. Such a claim would in fact be far more valid for the Heilige family. Yet one will obviously not be able to hold Meiring accountable for the republication of one but not the other. If we are going to hold Meiring responsible for lending Zara Judenfrage a new influence and respectability, we will also have to credit him with the publication of the Heilige family, including those passages in it that ought to have demonstrated yet further just how inadequate the interpretations of Zara Judenfrage accepted throughout the socialist movement really were. We might add that Meiring's introduction to Zara Judenfrage in Nach Lass euch Glob, in fact, not only offered a good summary of the positions of Feuerbach, Ma Bauer, and Marx, <clears throat> not only offered a good summary of the positions of Feuerbach, Mauer, and Marx, it even con concluded, quote, with a final statement which, interestingly enough, draws more on Marx's second version of the Jewish question in the Holy Family, that is, the Heilige Family, than on the original essays. Hmm. What Mehring provided then <clears throat> was <clears throat> a relatively accurate paraphrase of Zara Judenfrage that stressed the importance of both parts and the need to read them in conjunction. Whatever its shortcomings, Mehring's summary certainly did Zara Judenfrage more justice than virtually all his peers did in their more or less perfunctory dealings with it. What is more, his paraphrase clarified some of the ambiguities of Zer Judenfrage by drawing on the less ambiguous formulations in the Heilige family. It is all the more remarkable that all this did not prevent him from still subscribing to the fundamental misunderstandings of Marxist stance prevalent amongst his peers. Why was he unable to recognize these misunderstandings despite his more intimate familiarity and more sustained dealings with the sources? Did the strength of his own anti-Jewish sentiments prevent him from recognizing that his peers had got it wrong? Or was the prevalent misinterpretation of Marx's stance simply so widely and unquestionably accepted that any suggestion it was wrong would have seemed like suggesting that the earth was flat after all? Either way, as far as these fundamental misunderstandings are concerned, the fact remains that Mehring, far from being an exception among Imperial German Social Democrats, was entirely representative of his peers. Okay, this is uh, page 91. Then we're going to get into Mehring's specific spin on Zer Judenfrage, which is, you know, what the Social Democrats were guilty of. Now, that'll be enough for today. So this is part 10 of the, the uh, study and book on socialist response to anti-Semitism in German imperial state. Okay? That's Fisher. Published by Cambridge University Press, I believe. Okay. And here in the background that we have not in our name, sitting side by side, probably with 
if not now, and Jewish Voice for Peace, all of whom are sliding inevitably by necessity into the Jewish Bund. I'm not going to go into becoming a social democrat. <laughs> Look at what we've been reading. Okay. So the link to the uh, study itself, the socialist response to anti-Semitism in the German imperial state, by Les Fischer, is in the link that's provided both in the chat and in the comment to this video. And this video and all the previous nine versions should be shared to those Jewish people who are serious about figuring out what to do about leftism and the Bund and uh, Zionism. This is essential because in response to Zionism, we don't become, you know, negationists. We don't become those that deny one that anti-Semitism exists, even in the left. It has a long-standing history and has to be un unraveled before it can dissipate. It has to be unraveled in public before all those who hold of it, who keep hold of its various strands. And uh, we have to do this in the in the form of uh, the Jewish Bund because we cannot give up on the struggle to defend the Jewish people because we know that Jewish people are an oppressed nation. The Zionist scheme of things, recognizing, as Jewish people generally do, that we are an oppressed nation, obviously, and inevitably under capitalism, and it is not going away, just as assimilation did not help in uh, Germany, did not help in the Spain of 1492 or England of 1290 or in France four times, the Jewish population was expelled, even though they were assimilating. So we have to find the only available path forward, which is the Jewish Bund. And so I invite you to examine the, the data, the history, and the inevitable conclusion of the actuality that we face as Jewish people, not as Jews. Jews, that's a term the Nazis use, you know, to put on the yellow star. It's a derogatory term. Why? Because it's this... Uh, it is an objectification of an any given individual Jewish person. And it misses the whole point that Jewish people are human, two, that Jewish people are a collectivity, and we define ourselves as a people nation, not as a nation state. That comes from Protestantism. Zionists are basically Jewish Protestants. Get it? No apologies. Okay, bye for now.